Welcome. Uh, I'm Dr. David Wargowski. I'm the principal investigator of the Great Lakes FASD Regional Training Center. This presentation is the fifth in a series of podcasts based on the FASD Competency-Based Curriculum Development Guide developed by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The goal of this is to educate physicians and allied health providers about the prevention, identification, and treatment of FASDs. This fifth podcast will address the diagnosis and assessment of individuals suspected of having FASDs. We'll begin by talking about fetal alcohol syndrome, its cardinal features, and some associated findings, as well as some other conditions that might sometimes be thought of as resembling fetal alcohol syndrome. We'll briefly review the diagnostic process and then talk about varying approaches to the various categories of diagnoses under the FASD umbrella. First, looking at the diagnostic criteria for fetal alcohol syndrome, it requires identification of anomalies in three areas, growth, facial features, and central nervous system impairments, which can be either structural or functional. CDC criteria recommend, whenever possible, to adjust these according to age, gender, and racial norms. Looking at growth, Birth weight is often reduced, and typically weight gain remains poor, but many times does increase, and in fact obesity is now a bit more common in adolescents with FASDs than in the general population. Similarly, short stature typically persists, but doesn't always, and microcephaly most often persists, but in fact there have been cases in which this also has resolved. Growth measurements are defined as abnormal if they fall between the 10th percentile for height or weight at any age unless it can be accounted for by an intercurrent illness. The cardinal facial features of fetal alcohol syndrome include short palpebral fissures, which according to the CDC criteria are defined as at or below the 10th percentile, a smooth philtrum, and a thin upper lip, both of which use the University of Washington Lip Philtrum Guide, and a score of four or five as definitions. This cartoon exhibits several of the cardinal facial features as well as some others that are sometimes seen in children with fetal alcohol syndrome. These pictures demonstrate the use of the University of Washington Lip Filtrum Guide as well as a measurement of the palpebral fissures using a transparent ruler. Other morphologic features that are occasionally seen in children with fetal alcohol syndrome include abnormalities of the eye, cleft lip and palate, heart defects, vertebral abnormalities, renal abnormalities, and limb abnormalities, particularly fusion of the radius and ulna. In adolescence, overall the facial appearance changes because with puberty the nose and chin become more prominent and other changes are evident. However, the cardinal features of fetal alcohol syndrome, the small palpebral fissures, smooth filtrum, and thin upper lip persist. None of these characteristics is unique to fetal alcohol syndrome by itself. There are other conditions that can cause similar patterns of physical characteristics and growth impairment and should be considered when a child is evaluated for fetal alcohol syndrome. Other conditions that should be considered uh, when a child is evaluated for fetal alcohol syndrome include those listed on the slides. Although each of these in some way overlaps with fetal alcohol syndrome, they all can be easily distinguished from FAS. Looking at central nervous system abnormalities, the criteria used by the CDC include microcephaly, defined as a head circumference at or below the 10th percentile, and disproportionately small in children who also have global growth deficiency, or other clinically significant structural brain abnormalities that are seen on neuroimaging, particularly those affecting the corpus callosum, cerebellum, or basal ganglia. Functional abnormalities of the central nervous system can include global cognitive deficits or intellectual disabilities, or deficits in three or more specific functional domains. Again, the CDC guidelines strongly recommend that these domains be assessed using norm-referenced standardized measures and using reliable, validated instruments. The central nervous system effects of prenatal alcohol exposure have been well delineated and are known to be characteristic of prenatal alcohol exposure. However, questions remain about the specificity of these findings. Many other genetic conditions include 
uh, central nervous system impairments that can at times be similar to those seen in fetal alcohol syndrome. Similarly, other environmental factors can also cause similar central nervous system deficits. The diagnostic assessment begins with a history, including a review of available records. First is to gather as much information as is available regarding the history of exposure to alcohol before birth. Birth records can be reviewed to record birth weight, length, and head circumference. And similarly, postnatal growth can be obtained from childhood growth records. Medical records can provide information about the presence of congenital anomalies that potentially could have been repaired before the child came under care. And when available, results of cognitive assessments can also be very helpful. Many providers find it challenging to question mothers about alcohol use during pregnancy. We find it helpful to consider different circumstances in which such a history might be obtained. For birth mothers who are actively drinking, a denial can present its own challenges. Many mothers are also quite defensive because they've at least heard the superficial message that drinking during pregnancy is bad. It's important to acknowledge the guilt and blame issues that are inevitably contained in this context and to address them up front. That can be assisted by modifying the environment to make it as non-threatening as possible, by expressing statements of empathy and enforcing that this is not intended to assign blame on the mother, but rather to find ways to best serve their child. In every situation, we try to find common ground and work toward details of alcohol consumption during the pregnancy. And as in several of the other scenarios I'll present, always keeping a bit of healthy skepticism about the information that we're given. Birth mothers in treatment are often surprisingly forthcoming about their alcohol intake. And in fact, this is the one scenario in which information provided is often most reliable. Nevertheless, an empathetic approach and non-judgmental attitude can be very facilitative. Again, working toward common ground and attempting to get as much detail as possible about the alcohol consumption. The further one moves away from the birth mother, the more indirect the information can be, which inevitably introduces either biases or errors. It's very rare for this to be intentional, more often a matter of accurate information transfer. Clarifying the basis of information by which the parents describe the alcohol exposure can be very helpful. The physical assessment includes growth measurements, measurement of the palpebral fissure length, assessment of the ears, mid-face, and philtrum and lip, examination of the palate, auscultation of the heart, and a quick examination of the elbows and fingers. For a demonstration, the supplement to this podcast is available. Very often after the assessment, we find that all of the historical and physical information that is available is vague or equivocal. Many times it's helpful to have diagnostic alternatives besides fetal alcohol syndrome. Approaches to these other categories under the FASD umbrella vary. The Institute of Medicine developed a diagnostic categorization system and a set of diagnostic criteria in the 1990s. These were modified in 2005 in an article published by Eugene Hoime and others. According to this system, the categories include fetal alcohol syndrome, partial fetal alcohol syndrome, alcohol-related birth defects, and alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorder. Fetal alcohol syndrome is defined as having at least two of the three cardinal facial features, length, height, or weight below the 10th centile, and microcephaly or structural brain abnormalities. Partial fetal alcohol syndrome uses the same criteria, but the child can have either growth or central nervous system abnormalities. For ARBD, confirmation of alcohol exposure is required. Because the diagnostic criteria are not quite as specific as for partial FAS and FAS, they do require identification of typical facial features and other major or minor congenital anomalies associated with prenatal alcohol exposure. For ARND, again, confirmation of exposure is required. Central nervous system abnormalities, either structural or functional, must be identified. The University of Washington's system has been developed and revised through the University of Washington Fetal Alcohol Syndrome Diagnostic and Prevention Network. This employs a four-digit code, 
to characterize the growth manifestations, facial features, central nervous system injury, and alcohol exposure. This generates a four-digit code that is associated with a specific diagnostic category. There are 22 separate diagnostic categories, examples of which are listed in this slide. Both systems have legitimacy and find a clinical utility. The Washington system has the advantage of being somewhat more specific to provide an outstanding foundation for longitudinal research and introducing objectivity into the process. The Institute of Medicine categories are more intuitive. In our experience, the diagnostic terms are more within the reach of most patients, and it does introduce some subjectivity. If you have questions, please feel free to contact us. Outside the region, the best way is through our website.